Welcome to Storytime. Today I will be telling you the story of how 2020 became Joe Biden's year. It's a tale of tragedy, sorrow, empathy, perseverance, courage, and resilience. I can almost guarantee that you'll learn something new and that you'll found new respect for Vice President Biden. I don't want to interrupt the story with calls to action, so if you enjoy this video, give it a like and subscribe as well. If you want to see me do one of these for another politician, tell me down below in the comments section. Without further to do, sit down, strap in, two tragedies 43 years apart have defined the former vice president's life, but it's also made him a more formidable candidate in the crazier that is 2020. If you can't admire Joe Biden as a person, then it's probably, you got a problem. <laughs> you need to do some self-evaluation, because what's not to like? He is as good a man as God ever created. He said some of the most incredibly heartfelt things that anybody could ever say to me. He's the nicest person I think I've ever met in politics. By the middle of February, Bernie Sanders had finished second in Iowa, won New Hampshire, then won Nevada. He seemed unstoppable. He was going to be the Democratic nominee. The revolution was going to win the nomination and reform Washington from the top down. Then something happened. Something changed. The earth had seemingly moved from underneath us. For all of those of you who've been knocked down, counted out, left behind, this is your campaign. Just days ago, the press and the pundits had declared this candidacy dead. Now, thanks to all of you, the heart of the Democratic Party, we just won and we've won big because of you. Joe Biden won South Carolina. Then, three days later, he dominated Super Tuesday. Winning states assumed to be secured by other candidates like Virginia, Massachusetts, Minnesota, and Texas only a week earlier. Biden even held his own in Vermont, Bernie's home state, a state Bernie won by 72 points in 2016. Joe Biden received 22% of the vote, limiting Bernie's win to only 30 points. Joe Biden pulled off the greatest political comeback in the modern era. Politics and elections are a game of addition. So Joe's win can easily be explained by the moderate wing consolidating behind Joe Biden and Bernie never attempting to, or perhaps failing, to branch out from his core 30%. The left had its concerns about Joe Biden, everything from being a gaffe machine to often saying everything he's thinking in his less than ideal legislative career while being a senator. But he was the nominee, and we're going to have to figure out how to get around those flaws. Just like those five days in late February though, the world changed again this time very fast. As Alabama and Missouri just joined 40 other states that are urging people to stay home. That covers nearly 95% of the U.S. population. World Health Organization today officially designating coronavirus as a global pandemic. Congress's in-house doctor told Capitol Hill staffers at a closed door meeting this week that, that he expects 75 to 150 million people in the United States to contract the coronavirus. New tests led by the U.S. government scientists show the virus can live in the air for several hours and on some surfaces for up to three days. The United States became the epicenter for coronavirus. Since we elected an idiot to be president, 100,000 Americans died in 50 days. As we speak, over 2 million Americans contracted COVID-19. Our lives changed in a matter of a week. We all of a sudden worked from home or we lost our jobs. We stopped seeing our friends, at least we should have. And we started to wear face masks. We sat inside while our friends, coworkers, and families did the same, hoping and praying that none of us were unlucky enough to catch it. After three months of stay-at-home orders for the North and the West Coast, and like four hours of stay-at-home orders for the South, America began to reopen. And then the world changed again. Prosecutors say Officer Derek Chauvin had his knee on George Floyd's neck for 8 minutes and 46 seconds, including 2 minutes and 53 seconds after Floyd had become unresponsive. According to the charging documents, police were responding to a call of Floyd using a counterfeit $20 bill. During the attempt to put a handcuffed Floyd into the police car, the defendant pulled Mr. Floyd out of the passenger side of the squad car, held him with a knee to the neck. At one point, another officer asked, should we roll him on his side? Chauvin replied, no, staying put where we got him. Prosecutors contend Mr. Floyd being restrained by the police, his underlying health conditions, and any potential intoxicants in his system likely contributed to his death. George Floyd was murdered by a Minneapolis police officer. 
For 8 minutes and 46 seconds, a monster slowly suffocated George Floyd. Nationwide protests broke out, a nationwide outpouring of emotion, and a nationwide come to Jesus moment for white America happened along with it. America's hurting. One of the most important things to have right now in 2020 is empathy. Joe Biden's superpower is empathy. His own life has taught him perseverance. There's not a more tragic politician in modern American history. This makes him uniquely capable of leading a nation grappling with death. As a country confronts the heart-wrenching, heart-breaking, overlapping crises of death of this moment, what America needs right now is to heal. And Joe has that capacity to heal. In order to know how the former vice president has that capacity, you have to know Joe. Your grandpa worked in a, uh, in a silk mill. So, oh, sorry. I'm doing this because maybe when I need a job, Ray-Ban may have me as a sponsor. It's Friday, November 20th, 1942. Two months earlier, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. President John F. Kennedy is 20 days away from having his first command in World War II. America's at war. This particular Friday in Scranton is sunny with a high of 70 degrees, 20 degrees hotter than the average November 20th for Scranton, Pennsylvania. This is a particularly special day for the Biden family, however, an Irish family that had come to America 100 years earlier. This is a particular special day because Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. is born. Uh, Vice President Biden, what advice would you give a college student who has struggled with stuttering since he was a young child? You know, uh, um, stuttering, you think about it, is the only handicap that people still laugh about, that still humiliate people about. And they don't even mean to. When I was a kid, I talk like that. And some of you smile. If I said to you when I was a kid, I had a cleft palate and people made fun of me, or I had a withered arm, no one would smile. No one would smile. It's a debilitating situation. Joe Biden was born with a stutter. Biden struggled with the stutter and the kids called him Dash and Joe Impedimenta to mock him. This stutter is why Joe Biden is so prone to making gaffes. Did you see the movie, The King's Speech? Well, you should see it if you haven't. What The King's Speech is all about is a man with enormous courage standing up in the middle of the beginning of war, speaking to his countrymen and saying he needed help. The guy who actually helped him write that speech knew how I do my speech and how I mark up my speeches. I, I go through so that I make sure that I try to get a circumstance where I don't have to go quickly. He used a speaking strategy called circumlocation. A lot of stutterers use it. You know how your GPS recalculates so you avoid traffic, construction, and storms? Circumlocation is like that, but for your mouth. And so what I say to any, anybody out there, and any of the people you work with, young people who, who stutter, I'll give you my phone number, not a joke, and they can call me. I'll give you a private number because it's really important. They know, they know, they want to say, you, you really did stutter? And, you, and I still occasionally, when I find myself really tired, c catch myself saying something like that. It has nothing to do with your intelligence quotient. It has nothing to do with your intellectual makeup. It has something to do with going back a long time relating to, I think part of it is confidence and how you were, what, what circumstance you faced. I know I'm talking too long about this, but I feel desperately, I, I feel strongly about this. Joe can't say certain words without stuttering, so he looks for ways around it. You'll notice that a lot of the gaffes happen around words that don't have any replacement words, like names, countries, and states. This is mixed with Joe's tendency to be too authentic by saying everything he's thinking. This can often get him in trouble. It's also why sometimes his points aren't as clear as they could be. Not that the other guy makes any sense either. And I tested very positively in, a, in another sense. So negative. this morning, yeah, I tested positively toward negative, right? So no, I tested uh, perfectly this morning. In 1966, Joe Biden got married to Nelia Hunter. Together they had three kids, Bo, Hunter, and Naomi. I'm Joe Biden and I'm a candidate for the United States Senate. I've asked my staff to tape record some statements people made when I campaigned at Price's Corner Shopping Mall. Do you believe politicians when they tell you something in an election year? No. Most of the time, no. No comment. That's what we've come to. 
politicians have done such a job on the people that the people don't believe them anymore. And I'd like a shot at changing that. Joe Biden became the sixth youngest senator in U.S. history in 1972 when he won his first election to be a U.S. senator when he upset a Delaware institution and longtime senator Caleb Boggs. Well, we saw the House results a while ago. Let's take a look at how the Senate looks now so far tonight. The Senate races. The Democrats have won six. The Republicans have won five. The, Re the Democrats are the only ones who've gained a seat they did not have before. We'd like to take a look at two races that are very close and that deserve uh, watching. We haven't been able to declare because they've been too close. The state of Delaware, first of all, in the Senate race there, the incumbent senator, Caleb Boggs, is running a little behind a man named Joseph Biden, who is too young to go into the U.S. Senate. He won't be 30 until November the 20th. Boggs is following, lagging behind Biden. On December 18, 1972, Joe Biden was setting up his first ever Senate office and interviewing future staff. This is a very big and often Senator's first memory of ever being a Senator-elect. Mr. President, Senator Elect Biden for you. Yes. Ready? Hello. Uh, just a minute, Mr. President. Hello, Mr. President. How are you? Senator, I know this is a, a very tragic day for you, but I wanted you to know that all of us here at the White House, we're thinking about you and praying for you, and uh, and also for your uh, your uh, two children. And uh, shared that very much. We uh, we know that uh, I understand you were on the hill at the time, and uh, your wife was just driving by herself. Yes, so uh, so the uh, but uh, in any event, uh, I mean, looking at it in a as as you must in terms of the future, because you you have the great fortune of being young. I remember I was two years older than you and I went to the house. <laughs> but the main point is you can remember that she was there when you won a great victory and uh, you enjoyed it together. And now I'm sure that uh, she'll be watching you from now on. Good luck to you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Okay. Thank you call. I appreciate it. His wife, Nelia, and their kids, Bo, who was three, and Hunter, who was two, and Naomi, who was one, were returning from getting the family Christmas tree when a truck carrying corn broadsided the Biden's white Chevrolet station wagon. It broke off the left rear wheel and drove the back door into the back seat, sending the car 150 feet into the forest of evergreens. His wife, Nelia, and his daughter were announced dead on arrival. His sons, Bo and Hunter, sustained critical injuries. Bo with numerous broken bones and Hunter with severe head injuries. Joe called the Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield and told him that he was not going to be showing up on January 3rd to be sworn in as a U.S. Senator because he no longer wanted to be a U.S. Senator. He didn't want to be in Washington. He wanted to be with his sons in Delaware. The Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield called Joe and pleaded with him to just give it six months and see how it goes. Joe ultimately gave in and was sworn into the U.S. Senate inside his son's hospital room. After a car crash changed his life forever, Joe Biden took the train home from Washington every day to raise his sons. They had the health care they needed. Too many families don't. And that's why Joe Biden is running for president. Joe took the Amtrak train round trip for four hours every day from Wilmington, Delaware to Washington, D.C. and back every single day so he could be with his sons. Here is Joe Biden in 2012 talking about losing loved ones and his own suicidal thoughts. On December 18th, I was down in Washington. I'm the first United States Senator I ever knew. <laughs> and I was down in Washington hiring my staff, and I got a phone call saying that uh, my family had been in an accident. <clears throat> and just like you guys know, by the tone of the phone call, you just knew, didn't you? I don't know how I knew. But the call said, my wife was dead. My daughter was dead, and I wasn't sure how my sons were going to make it. It was the first time in my career, in my life, I realized someone could go out, and I probably shouldn't say this to the press here, but no, but it's more important. You're more important. For the first time in my life, I understood how someone could consciously decide to commit suicide. Not because they were deranged, not because they were nuts, because they'd been to the top of the mountain and they just knew in their heart they'd never get there again, that there was never going to get, never going to be that way ever again. There really is hope. 
The ache in the back never goes away. But it gets controllable. I promise you, and you parents as well, when the thought of your son or daughter or your husband or wife brings a smile to your lips before it brings a tear to your eye, it will happen. My prayer for you is that day will come sooner or later. But the only thing I have more experience than you in is this. I'm telling you, it will come. Joe Biden then went on and married Dr. Jill Biden, and they had another daughter named Ashley. In 1988, Senator Biden ran for president for the first time. After conceding just last weekend that no one knows me, Senator Joseph Biden of Delaware today became the fifth Democrat to declare he's seeking the party's presidential nomination. Lim Tucker has our report. In 1988, the clarion call for my generation is not it is our turn, but rather it is our moment of obligation and opportunity. He is Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. from Delaware, 44 years old, 14 years in the U.S. Senate Chairman Judiciary Committee, a Democrat who calls himself a pragmatic liberal. He has a reputation as maybe the best orator in the Senate, but a long-winded one. And he is criticized by some in his party for being a senator and candidate of themes, not substance. Biden rejects that criticism, but today, oratory and themes were very much on display. And for a decade led by Ronald Reagan, self-aggrandizement has become the full-throated cry of this society. I've got mine, so why don't you go get yours? His campaign started off with strong sales, only to hit a rock that would ultimately sink his campaign. Joe Biden was accused of plagiarizing the Kennedy brothers during his campaign speeches cannot measure the health of our children, the quality of our education, the joy of their play. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. Let us pledge that our generation of Americans will pay any price, bear any burden, accept any challenge, and meet any hardship to secure the blessings of prosperity and the promise of opportunity for our children. We shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. As with most things in life, when it rains, it pours. Senator Biden passed out in a hotel room in February 1988. He suffered two brain aneurysms. He underwent life-saving surgery and spent seven months away from the U.S. Senate recovering. In 2008, Joe Biden found his best friend. However, like most best friends, they didn't always get along at first. The two men served together on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in the U.S. Senate. Where several aides insisted Obama would listen to Biden holding forth in the committee and roll his eyes, annoyed with the pace that Congress moved and Biden's stubbornness to keep it that way. Biden asked Obama to dinner in 2004, saying that he would pay. Obama shot back that he could afford to pay. Obama, after all, was earning millions from his memoirs. Four years later, they would leave the bingo hall that is C-SPAN and duke it out in front of the whole country. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Asked, is he ready? You said, I think he can be ready, but right now I don't believe he is. The presidency is not something that lends itself to on-the-job training. I think that I stand by the statement. Joe Biden ran for president a second time in 2008. And it didn't go as well as he would have hoped, but about as well as it could go if you're not going to win. My vice president will be... It's been one of the most highly anticipated announcements of the 2008 presidential campaign. A Democratic official says Delaware Senator Joe Biden is Barack Obama's vice presidential nominee. Obama's campaign has not yet confirmed the announcement. He became the vice president of the United States in 2008. And about six months in, the president looked at me and said, You know, Joe, you know what surprised me? We've become such good friends. <laughs> I said, surprised you. 
Joe Biden's son, Bo, resembled his father in all ways. He became attorney general for the state of Delaware in 2006. Midway through his first term, Bo's National Guard Battalion was deployed to Iraq. Bo continued to be attorney general while serving Iraq. He would go on to serve two terms. In 2013, Bo was diagnosed with brain cancer. Bo beat his brain cancer in 2014. He announced that he would be running for governor of Delaware in 2016, so he would not be seeking a third term as attorney general in 2014. Bo was readmitted to the hospital in May of 2015 due to his brain cancer coming out of remission. Five days later, Bo Biden passed away at the age of 46. Joe, Bo should be the one running for president, not me. Um, every morning I get up, Joe, not a joke, I think to myself, is he proud of me? Um, because he's the one who wanted me to stay engaged, made me promise, promise me, Dad, promise me, Dad, you'll stay engaged. Didn't mean I had to run for president, but I would not walk. He was worried I'd walk away from what I've worked on my whole life since I've been 24 years old. And uh, he is part of me, Joe. Um, and uh, so is my surviving son, Hunter and Ashley. They are, they are, uh, um, I, he, he, he walks with me. I know that sounds to some people kind of silly, but he really, honest to God, does. I know he's in me. The same cancer that killed Senator Ted Kennedy 10 years ago and Senator John McCain two years ago is the same that took Bo. Joe Biden often talks about how President Obama and him are brothers and best friends. To give you an idea of that bond. We, we, were, we were having lunch and it was pretty clear Bo was having trouble uh, with his speech and he still had three months to go, four months to go as Attorney General. And my son, Bo Biden, was the most fastidious, honorable, straight guy. And I knew if my son thought he was losing his cognitive capability, he wouldn't stay on as Attorney General. He'd resign. Thank God he took all these tests and there was no cognitive impact, but his speech made it. He was affecting his speech center. And so I was having lunch with the President, and he was the only guy other than my family I confided all along and everything that was going on with Bo, because I felt a responsibility to do that so that he knew where I was, my mm -hmm. thinking. And um, I said, uh, you know, my, my concern is, I said, if Bo resigns, he has no, there, 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 there's no, uh, nothing to fall back on, his salary. And I said, but I worked it out. I said, but Jill and I will sell the house, we'll be in good shape. And he got up, he said, don't sell that house. Promise me you won't sell the house. Uh, he's going to be mad at me saying this. He said, I'll give you the money. Whatever you need, I'll give you the money. Don't, Joe. Promise me. Promise me. I said, I don't think we're going to have to anyway. He said, promise me. And then I'll never forget the eulogy he delivered for Bo. Right. And uh, when Bo had a stroke, uh, when they had a stroke and they thought it, it turned out it was the beginning of the glioblastoma, and he came running down the hallway in his shirt sleeves to Joe, Joe, is he okay? His love of family and my family and my love of his family, you know, his two granddaughter, his two children and my granddaughters are best friends. In 2019, Joe Biden announced he would run for president. Almost immediately, his only surviving son became the target for attacks from the right and the president of the United States. Hunter Biden became one of the vocal points of the impeachment trial of Donald Trump. And throughout all of this, Joe Biden handled it with grace. Amazing grace. Joe has had to deal with all this loss, sorrow, and grief in the public eye. Vice President Biden has never been a man drawn to cynicism or to doom and gloom politics. Rather, he's a throwback to a time when we weren't so divided. The last of the era of American politicians who watched JFK give urgency to the idea of pursuing a natural purpose, a great American mission, a true believer in the boundless potential of America through personal and professional tragedies that would have taken down a lesser man. Biden's faith never wavered. He kept on pushing on. Far too often it feels as if our politicians just had the luck of the draw in a perfect life leading up to them taking office. And we, the people are the unexceptional ones. 
That's not Joe, though. Joe is one of us. His entire political career has been marked by personal loss that makes him uniquely capable of leading a nation grappling with death. Now you know Joe. Election day is November 4th. You know what you have to do. But the Taoiseach knows a lot about it. His mom uh, lived in, uh, in Long Island for 10 years or so. Uh, God rest her soul. And uh, um, although she's, wait, your mom's still, your mom's still alive as your dad passed. God bless her soul. I gotta get this straight. <laughs>